So today we've talked about trash in the classroom. So today we're going to talk about plastic and then what you might call the backlash to trash. But I would like to start out just for a few moments, even before I switch to the PowerPoint, just talking a little bit about plastic itself, uh, which right now I've got plastic on my eyeglasses, the microphone is mostly made of plastic, even the screen and the camera is actually made of plastic. Um, and, it, and again, it's everywhere around us, everything from the phone. And I have several examples of plastic here. Um, and as I show these to you, I, was, I actually was gonna bring these to class and I had them in my car, but I knew I wasn't gonna have time to get to it. Um, so I want you to think, as I show you some pieces of plastic, think about which of these things do you think can be reused or recycled? So um, let's see, I'll, I'll use a big thing here. So I have an empty thing, a cat litter, hard plastic. And you know, maybe I'm thinking about recycling it. So I'm looking around to see if it tells me if I can recycle it. And then I look, let me see if I can make you see it. There's like a little arrow there, a, a triangle with what you might call chasing arrows. And then there's actually a number and some letters that say HDPE. Uh, we'll figure out what those are later. Uh, I got a milk jug and it's got the, I think it has the same thing on the bottom here. Uh, anyway, uh, and I have a, a clear thing made of plastic. Uh, and then let's see, I have, uh, I have pets. So I have a cleaner here and this one has, also has the little chasing arrows. And I think it's also HDPE. Um, I have a K-cup here, a little softer plastic uh, for coffee. I don't see an arrow. Well, do I? Oh, no, actually, there is a little, uh, I, I, don't, I think it's too whited out, unfortunately, but there's a little arrow on it that says a five. Uh, let's see, razors, got some metal on it, but also some plastic. Got a clamshell thing here. I think this is uh, raspberries. But uh, it too has the chasing arrows. So uh, that looks like the recycle uh, thing. And I'm, my chair is sinking, which is partly made of plastic. Um, plastic spoon, a lid, some Tupperware, which also has the uh, triangle on it. A little creamer cup. Let's see, um, I guess... Uh, Thing from the shower that's empty, little triangle on that. Plastic bags, things that as the lemons came in. This is plastic as well, or a plastic bag. <laughs> and and I think that's more than enough. For, oh oh, I did want to show one more thing. It's very dusty. I actually meant to clean it before I started filming it. This is actually it's, it's on my desk. It's an old. Um, Kind of like a microphone, but an old one. It's really for like, you know, intercom thing, maybe RCA. And, um, no triangle in this one. This is from the 1930s. And it's pretty hard. I mean, in other words, if I dropped it, 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 it would maybe even shatter. It's a little more glass like. This is known as Bakelite. And we'll talk more, which these glasses are not, but they kind of are supposed to imitate Bakelite. Um, I would remember Bakelite because we're going to talk about this later. This is actually uh, there. Th this is not worth anything, but uh, the plastic itself is actually extremely historic because it's actually the first real plastic in, in any real sense. Anyway, uh, I'll show you some pictures of Bakelite in a moment. So which one of those do you think uh, maybe that we can recycle? Uh, all of it? None of it? Some of it? Is it just the things with the triangle and those arrows? Um, and again, how much do you think actually does get recycled? We try to recycle quite a bit here in our family. Um, every Tuesday night, I take the recycling out um, in a big plastic tub. Um, and all, almost all of this, I would stick in that tub. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit later about what might can be recycled a little bit. I mean, that's, I don't want to get too much into that. But, um, but where do those triangles come from? And what do they actually mean? Do they mean recycled? Maybe, maybe not. Another thing I wanted to do in class, you get a new chair. Uh, one of the things I needed, I wanted to do in class 
is, and I'm going to do it now just for a moment, and then I'll finally switch to the PowerPoint. You don't have to look at this all day. Um, I mean, think about just how ubiquitous plastic is. In fact, as I'm talking, I'm just kind of looking on my messy desk, and I'm just I'm constantly, everything is plastic. The light shining, this light, I got a water bottle here. I mean, it's just, again, it's just absolutely everywhere. Think for a moment, if, if you could, if I had an assignment, sort of like make your own fire kind of assignment, but not for real. <laughs> Imagine if you had to go a whole day, just a normal day, but you couldn't touch any plastic. Could you do it? And I mean, think about, for, like if we were in class, what I would say is think about the moment you got up in the morning or afternoon to when you actually came to class, you know, from, from the time you got out of bed to coming to class. Think about all the plastic you probably would have touched. So just to give you an example, I mean, just kind of walk you through just even just the beginning of that. So you wake up in the morning, uh, maybe it's an alarm that goes off. So maybe you reach for the alarm or, you know, in those cases, probably the phone and you click, you know, and turn it off. Is what you touch made of plastic? Uh, the, you know, okay, and then what's the first thing you might do? In my case, would be put on glasses, but would it be to check your email? Would it be on your phone? Would you go to your computer, check YouTube uh, or check Facebook or something? Um, would you go make breakfast, you know, and so you turn on your oven maybe, um, or, you know, maybe you get some eggs out of a container. So what's the container made out of, or get some bacon out? or maybe you get a Pop-Tart, maybe you're gonna toast something, so you have a toaster, so what's the toaster made of? What's the handle in the toaster made of? Even when you open the refrigerator door, what's, what was the handle made of? What, what's the shelves made of? What's the covering of the refrigerator? When you walked into the kitchen, what is the floor made of? The counter, is it covered in something like Formica or vinyl? Um, you eat, I mean, what are you eating with? What are you eating on? What, maybe you're making your lunch. What are you putting your lunch in? Is it a lunch box? Is it Ziploc bags? Which I meant that, oh, I got some nuts in like a Ziploc bag. I mean, that's plastic. Um, maybe you wrapped it in some kind of cling wrap. Um, maybe, you know, some kind of again, Tupperware bowl that you're gonna put it in. Maybe you're gonna put coffee in a cup. Uh, they maybe need to go take a shower. And so obviously, you might have one of these, but you might have something to scrub with. Um, you might have some facial cleaner, like especially some exfoliating stuff, which might have these little microscopic things, which might be plastic. You might brush your teeth. What's that made out of? Um, get your toothpaste, your deodorant or spray, uh, mouthwash, even turning on the sinks. In other words, I'm, I'm really just going through my house and what I might do, and almost everything I've mentioned would either be plastic or partly plastic, uh, getting in my car, literally touching the steering wheel, the, uh, the handle on the seatbelt, the handle on the door. Uh, I don't really do the radio anymore, but if I did the radio, the knobs on the radio. I mean, again, I, I, even my, the key fob is made of plastic. So I don't think I could actually go through a day, even if I wanted to, maybe if I was camping. And even then, I think most of the stuff I'd have flashlights on that would be made of plastic. I mean, it is, it is such a part of our lives that we literally kind of can't get away from it. So again, you know, when, when you have a chance, really stop and think about it. Um, what I, what I would have done in class was have you take out a sheet of paper and just start writing down everything at the beginning of the day, everything you touched that would be plastic. And for most people within two or three minutes, you would have 30 things at least. I mean, you, it would just be plastic, 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 plastic. Okay, let me very awkwardly here share my screen and then we'll kind of get on with it here. All right, should be sharing now, hopefully. Um, so again, plastics and the backlash against trash. So here I have I've been talking about plastic and showing various versions of plastic, which now we're going to go into the recycle bin. I was sitting in my car for a couple of days. Um, get this stuff out of my way. So Sort of what is plastic? I asked you guys that, which I don't have on me, but 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 maybe when I get to class next time, I'll, I'll summarize some of your answers because I saw some of you just literally sitting there. I remember one of you, it wasn't this bottle, obviously, but you had like a, a water bottle and somebody, I remember one of the people in the back just went, like, like this thing, whatever this thing is. 
and it is it's almost it, it's it, it, it you know it's so common but yet yet at the same time so different i mean i even the little bit i showed you and that's just a, a, a minor type they're all different yet they're all plastic so like what is it and it is kind of a trick question there really isn't one thing that's plastic it's more of a description of a collection of things so and this is actually my definition uh, you know instead of using a dictionary definition um, but they're, they're all going to say about the same thing and you can see it, it it's not necessarily a great definition um, it does get a little bit tough without getting totally chemical so it is a synthetic in other words human made substance that basically imitates natural products such as wood uh, glass rubber maybe a metal, uh, maybe even paper. I don't know, paper, you, we make paper, but we make it out of wood, right? Uh, or rice or something of that nature. So these are kind of natural products that paper, uh, that, that plastic is now imitating. So a bag, you know, this could have been paper at one time. And it would have been paper. Now it is plastic. Um, again, I pull my plastic bag. I mean, this could have been a metal a can at one time, right? Now it's plastic. It could have been a paper sack at one time. Now it's plastic. Uh, garbage bags, which I, I, I have one of those too. Garbage bags, uh, you know, would have been paper or just a can, metal can that you just threw everything in and dumped into the back of a truck. Uh, but, but now we have plastic that kind of imitates all of that, but in some cases actually functions better. And in many cases, as we'll see at the end, not only is it cheaper, but at least the making of some plastics is actually less carbon intensive than making, for instance, glass. Now, so the making of plastic may not be the problem. The problem with plastic might be, what do you do with it when it's done? But, and it's, it's, it's moldable and, and technically it's made of polymers, which is a very type of, a particular type of molecule, but essentially it's moldable. You can heat it, mold it into something else and then it can harden and it can be very hard or it could be you know, still soft. And there is a whole family of plastics. And we're gonna talk about a few of the common ones. We're not gonna get into every type of plastic. That's, that's basically a chemistry class and that's not what we're trying to do here. But this essentially is what plastic, and again, kind of a simple definition, uh, but it's kind of reflecting the fact that it is actually kind of hard to define. So um, at one time there was a Danish antiquarian, which is kind of an old word for an archeologist slash museum curator. So Christian Thompson, um, it, it, you know, collect things and was trying to catalog them. Again, this is still the, you know, the scientific revolution age. Um, you know, he had his cabinet of wonders, if you will. So in 1816, <clears throat> he published this idea of, and many people were trying to do this, but it's caught on, this idea of categorizing categorizing um, artifacts from the past. And so he came up with this initially a, a, a three stage progression of human history, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. You know, and then later, you know, I mean, the Industrial Revolution is another age. We talk about the Space Age. That's, that's why, that's where that comes from. Um, so, so even though historians today, you know, we still use these terms, but, but but they're not exactly used in the same way. But nonetheless, I mean, this has been ex extremely influential. And of course, a lot of people have said, you know, really, at least since maybe since the 1930s and definitely since World War II, are we, will people in the future describe, I mean, we talk about a digital age, and that's definitely the case, but is it also a plastic age? I mean, are we living, you know, will people look back, you know, in the same way we look for, you know, arrowheads or, you know, fire, evidence of fire, will it be plastic? They go, oh, plastic. Now we're talking about the 21st century because we found plastic. So will archaeologists use this to date us? And probably, yeah. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of people, mostly when they talk about the plastic age, they are not saying it in a nice way. Really, probably since the 1960s, uh, the idea of plastic has been seen as something that is negative you know if you talk about somebody being a plastic person you mean they're, they're they're not authentic they're not real um i remember there was a tv show called wkrp in cincinnati which i loved it late 70s early 80s show and, and again it was about a radio station and the opening credits um before the the, the 
theme song came on. You see somebody just changing the knob on a radio dial. You hear, you hear all these fake stations. And I always remember you hear part of a commercial and it said something like, um, our products are made from natural plastic. So don't settle for that artificial kind. And then it switches. And I remember my dad, first time I watched the show, as a little kid, and he laughed at it. I kept thinking like, why is that funny? Because I didn't think about it. But of course, the idea of organic plastic versus fake plastic, because the whole idea of plastic is that it is fake. And of course, there's the, the movie, The Graduate from 1967. And it's about a young man and a generation gap. And the young man is played by Dustin Hoffman. And there's a famous scene where he's at a party and, he's, and he realizes he, how out of touch he is with all these old guys. And one guy comes up to him and he's got a drink in his hand. He leans over and he says, let me tell you the secret to make money. Plastics. And again, at the time, it was seen as a really funny line because it was seen as, again, a symbol of the artificiality of modern society that you want to invest in plastics. Although actually it was very good, <laughs> very good economic advice in actuality. Um, so by the 60s, plastic was already seen as the emptiness of modern life, if you will. And yet here we, it, it, and it's like a lot of things we talk about and yet everything we touch is plastic and we pay good money for things that are often made out of plastic, don't we? But there was a time when people didn't feel quite so negatively about plastic. Plastic was seen as the promise of the future. This is a, a, an early uh, movie, The Plastic Age, and it wasn't meant ironically. You know, this was like amazing. In fact, and, and we'll talk about some of these plastics from the 20s and 30s that were seen as the future of the world. And in fact, our ability to make plastic partly helped us win World War II. And I'll, I'll briefly talk about that a little bit later. So I was just talking about the Debbie KRP joke, right? Yet, in actuality, there are kind of natural plastics, if you will. Uh, the, by the way, the one thing I forgot to say, plastic, the word actually comes from the Greek uh, plastikos, which again, kind of means bendable, moldable. Although, People would not at one time said natural plastics. Um, that's kind of retroactively said. But there are things in nature that function basically as plastic, but they are naturally occurring. So, for instance, there's a lot of these, but but some of the more famous ones, uh, shellac. Uh, I think nowadays we don't talk a lot about shellacking, uh, you know. But you know, shellac is a natural substance that can be used to coat things with. It comes from the lac beetle. Um, and it is an excretion from the lac beetle. People can harvest this and then turn it into other things. Uh, we don't see, again, a lot of shellac today, uh, but you've all probably had it if you ate, for instance, a jelly belly or some other kind of jelly bean. I gave out some Halloween candy. Um, I know there were some different types of little chewy candies, but those would have shellac around them. So you ate the, uh, the excretions of this bug. You probably have many times in your life. Uh, another one that, and again, we're really talking 19th century here when, when a lot of these were starting to be used, just various forms of rubbers, if you will, which is basically uh, a natural sap from various types of trees. Um, so we don't see rubber, say, in the United States a whole lot or Europe really until, uh, in many ways, until about the 19th century. But it is actually, in places like Africa and Central and South America, it is actually an ancient practice to use rubber. Christopher Columbus uh, remarked about seeing, for instance, the Tainos using um, a small ball that was this, he, he kept, he had a hard time describing it. It's like it's, it, you, it was kind of hard, but slightly soft. And when you struck it on the ground, it seemed to have this immense power. It was almost magic to them. Of course, it was a rubber ball, what he was describing. Uh, many Native American groups in the Southeast, in the Caribbean, in Central America, you know, would play various types of ball game. I mean, that's just a term we tend to give it today. Uh, sometimes they use a stone disc, like in Georgia, that was used a lot, or stone, little round stones, but some of these were made of rubber. And you go to museums today and, and see where archaeologists have found a lot of these rubber uh, balls that were used for games. Um, probably the most famous of these were the Mayans and, and their ball game. And in fact, Mayans were extremely uh, adapt at making um, various things out of rubber. So today you can go to parts of the Yucatan Peninsula and, and, and for shows for tourists, they, they do recreations of what they think the ball game would have been like, you know, uh, and it kind of, it's almost like basketball, but, but a little bit of soccer mixed in or hacky sack. Um, but for instance, uh, Mayan Indians, uh, 
taught some of the Spanish how to take rubber and melt it and then dip clothing into it and let it dry and suddenly you have waterproofed uh, clothing. So it's just a silly Google image, but things like what the British would later call the Mac, named for a guy named Macintosh who perfected this in the 19th century or wellies uh, from the name Wellington, rubber boots. Uh, so they were improved in the 19th century, but the core idea of this goes back to the Mayans uh, as far as the Spanish were concerned, back to the 1500s. And of course, that was a technology that went back a lot further. Rubber, as we know, it comes from various types of trees. Um, and like we do with turpentine in the south, uh, with long leaf pines and others, um, you, can, you can hack the trees a certain way and then collect this, basically the sap, and then you can heat it, you can mold it and turn it into all types of different products. Uh, in the late 19th century, uh, several people learned how in both Britain and the United States, Dunlop and Goodyear and others, again, names of a lot of famous tire companies, learned how to turn these into car tires and bicycle tires and later blimps and things of that nature. Um, and this actually becomes incredibly important in the, uh, by the way, sorry, sorry. And by the way, the process was vulcanization, the, the way they, they were able to take this natural rubber and turn it into something very durable. Um, but during World War II, the sources of rubber became a huge issue. And everybody, you know, to win the war started saving rubber because you needed rubber for rafts, you needed rubber for tires on trucks and planes. And so there was a huge rationing of tires and, and, and anything made of rubber. When the Japanese began to expand in the 1930s and early 1940s throughout the Pacific, the two things that they were doing in particular as they were choosing what to take over, one was oil, which you see here, uh, which, by the way, later a lot of plastics do are derived from oil and petroleum. Um, there's a huge, I'm not going to get much into this, but there's a, a huge uh, relationship between plastic companies and oil companies, and many times the same companies, because many of the plastic uh, plastics that we use today are derivatives or, or off, get off products from the, the uh, production of oil and gasoline. Anyway, so they were looking for oil sources, but they were also looking for rubber sources because they knew to win the war, especially being an island nation, they had to be able to control rubber supplies. So that's a lot of what they were doing. Um, and again, they were looking for a lot of these uh, European owned, in particular British owned rubber plantations in places like Sumat uh, Sumatra and Indonesia and places of that nature. The Germans uh, also were very concerned about this. In fact, one of the things that, that Adolf Hitler did, made sure he had in place before he invaded Poland in 1939, was that they had sources of synthetic rubber to make tires with. In fact, uh, before he invaded Poland, he bragged to his advisors. He said, we have figured out the, the rubber problem. So we, we're ready to go to war now. So again, we don't always think about these things as being integral to war. Uh, as I always say, and I'm not a military historian, but I always say, you know, amateurs talk about guns and bravery. Professionals talk about logistics, you know, whether you're talking about food or communications or, in this case, rubber supplies. And, of course, the United States also learned how to synthesize rubber. And, again, this played a big role in the ability to win the war. Another type of rubber-like material uh, that maybe you've heard of, if, if you're a golfer, you might know about this, especially if you're into the history of golf, Gouda perca, um, which is, uh, I think Gouda comes from the word for Malay, as in Malaysia, and perca refers to the sap uh, that, that comes out. Anyway, Gouda perca is, uh, is from a, a, a very particular type of tree, and it is a, a form of natural rubber. Basically, it is it's, it's a sap from it. Um, the big deal about this, uh, it, it is a thermoplastic, which means it can be heated and then molded. Uh, it won't melt. Um, a, lot of, a lot of these natural rubbers, the problem is when they get hot, they melt, so this will not melt. Um, so it can be used for a lot of, of, of things that rubber normally cannot be used for. 
again, it's an old practice of using this stuff. Uh, but as far as the industrial age is concerned, 1851 is when the United Kingdom began to sort of use it. They began to import it. And by the late 19th century, you were seeing lots and lots of things being made from Buda Perka. Uh, so again, here are some indigenous peoples in Asia actually working on getting Buda Perka out. Uh, but in, in, in England and then later other places, including the United States, you started getting Buda Perka factories and molding and all kinds of things like dolls and toys and combs and toothbrushes, um, golf balls, again, over the years, whenever I've talked about Buda Perka, sometimes in my US2 class, I'll mention this. And the only students I've ever heard of Buda Perka, they will say, have you ever heard of this? And one or two raise their hand and say, why do you know that? Golf, I know it from golf. So early golf balls were made of, not the earliest golf balls, because uh, that goes back to Scotland, uh, but uh, the earliest professional golf balls in the 19th century were made of Buda Perka. You might have Buda Perka in your mouth right now. A lot of teeth fillings are still made from Buda Perka. Um, so a lot, even modern dentistry uh, materials, actually Gouda Perka, and then synthetic versions of Gouda Perka. Another one I'm talking about just very briefly is amber, a naturally occurring substance that can be shaped into jewel, for instance, jewelry, buttons, things of that nature. Uh, so this is another type of basically natural plastic. One of the very first, uh, and we would call this a semi-synthetic plastic. It's basically taking cellulose from plants and then adding like camphor and a few other things to it to make it uh, a little more durable is known as celluloid. Billiard balls used to be made of celluloid. I'll come back to that. It's actually kind of important. But a guy named John Hyatt from upstate New York is the one who uh, discovered the idea of celluloid. In fact, he, the name he came up with, which means cellulose-like, basically. So, you know, a lot of things like billiard balls and uh, buttons and even glasses would have been made from things like ivory and tortoise shells. And, but we're getting to the point late 19th century where these animals are already becoming rare. So they're becoming very, you know, very expensive to make these things. So this was a substitute for that. And in fact, celluloid was used all kinds of ways. I mean, people today often collect antique celluloids. These are, you know, in fact, we, the, the best examples you see are usually in antique stores today of celluloid items. And of course, a lot of us, when we hear celluloid, we think, or at least a film buff like me, would think movies. Um, and what's kind of, and I'll come back to that, the, the, the movie part in a second. One of the things that celluloid does, and this is kind of what's going to spark other plastics, and again, this is not full on plastic, but it's getting there, right? Is the fact that it, it begins to level the playing field. You know, one of the big accomplishments of the late 19th century in particular, in the US and elsewhere, is that as we started making things, mass, uh, you know, with, with um, assembly lines and better communication and better transportation, uh, better machinery, cheaper substances, is suddenly you can get mass consumption because it's not just the rich people that can buy things, regular people can buy things. And of course, as we talked about the other day, we are now in a throwaway society. We use something and we get rid of it. Uh, this is, you know, my grandfather grew up in the Great Depression. And when he passed away a few years ago and we went through his house, I just could not believe how much stuff he had. He had stuff and stuff and stuff and stuff because he saved everything because he grew up in the depression and the idea that a can well i can use that can again i put a nail in it you know i, I can carry stuff in it um he wasn't quite from the throwaway society so today everything we do we use it and after a few years we get rid of it and get something new this is the beginning this is the the seed of that kind of society developing is you know with things like celluloid suddenly things do become cheaper um, and we can actually, you know, afford to use it and afford to throw it away and just buy it new. But the problem with celluloid, as you see there, is that it is flammable. And, and, and it, that, that can be a real problem, like film. Nitrate film, which is, is, a, is a type of celluloid, um, nothing looks like nitrate film. I can tell you as an archivist, as a film buff, nitrate film, whether it's photographs or a movie film, uh, the detail, and I, I don't have great photos to show you for this, but, but the detail is unbelievable. I mean, they, uh, when, when there was a switch away from nitrate film in the mid 20th century, photographs weren't quite as good. I mean, if you, I, I, I mean, as an archivist, I have spent time with a loop, a little magnifying, looking at negatives from, say, 
uh, the 1930s. And just the level of detail is just un unbelievable. And when you see a restored film from say the 1930s or even a silent film that's actually an original print, you just can't believe how crisp clear it is. Um, but again, the problem with nitrate film is it is highly flammable. Um, again, like at the archives I worked at, there, you know, our nitrate film was actually stored off-site uh, in a, in a, a, a flame-proof building um, because you never know when these things were gonna go up in flames. This is actually from a YouTube video and, and I, I encourage you, maybe I'll post it too. Uh, somebody just literally purposely lights a nitrate film fire and you just can't believe how big it burns. It's just a film. Um, and it just burns and burns and burns and burns and burns and burns. It's just, it's just going and going and going. Um, so that's a real problem. So Kodak invented what's known as the safety film. Even to, I know most of you probably don't deal with film anymore, but if you ever do see actual film, you'll almost see that almost always say safety film, basically saying this is not nitrate film. Um, so if you look at like a movie theater uh, in the 20s or 30s, I mean, it was a big deal to be a projector. You had to really know what you're doing. It was actually a very dangerous job. And so this is showing in the projection booth how protected it had to be uh, because of basically if, if a fire starts, because you have a hot bulb shining through, uh, you know, flammable material. Um, so uh, if that catches on fire, that's a real problem. So in fact, you notice it says all films kept outside because many movie theaters did indeed burn. Um, I, I did research a, a couple of years ago on Christmas in Scotland and the history of Christmas in Scotland. And one of the biggest tragedies in the country was in 19, I think 32 in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, they, they were showing a Christmas movie on Christmas day, uh, hundreds of little kids and a, a fire started in the projection booth. And I think 25, 30 kids were killed and hundreds were, were injured because they, they got trapped in this movie theater. And it, oops, and this is actually a really common thing. And of course, anybody's a Quentin Tarantino fan, if you've seen Glorious Bastards, uh, spoiler alert, the, the movie ends uh, with the death of the Nazis, uh, a fire started by a pile of nitrate film. And in fact, at the National Archives in 1978, uh, they were storing nitrate film off site and um, the nitrate film caught on fire. And it, it, it's one of the biggest archival disasters ever. You don't think about archival disasters, but this is one. And billiard balls, this was a real problem because originally they were made of ivory. This was an ivory substitute. Um, and the problem is uh, celluloid balls did indeed sometimes catch on fire. So that led to something, I know you can't see me anymore, but that led to Bakelite. Um, and again, if you've ever seen an old radio or an old television, you have seen Bakelite. So Leo, Bakeland um, is the person who is Belgian. He's a, a Belgian immigrant to New York. He's the one that came up with Bakelite. And this is you know, a quote from him. He said, I was you know, trying to, basically what he's describing uh, is plastic, of course. You know, this is, this, is, you know, this is him long after the fact. This cry once the word plastic became in wide use. Um, and again, I, I can't overemphasize how popular plastic used to be, how it was seen as, uh, of course, <laughs> I'm not re-recording this. I'm just gonna leave this air in, good Lord. <laughs> All righty, good Lord. All right. So what is Bakelite? Sorry, <laughs> wasting 10 seconds of your time there. So Bakelite is based, and I've heard it uh, Bakelite too, but, but most people rightly or wrongly call it Bakelite. So uh, it's basically phenol, mixed with formaldehyde and then placed into basically a high pressure cooker that was became known as the Bakelizer. Um, by the way, this is a repo. No, no, actually, no, this is the original. Um, sometimes you, some of the images online are repos of the original, but this is actually the Smithsonian's uh, um, has it. And so this is the original. And in fact, it's actually considered a national landmark because again, it basically began plastics. Bakelite is considered the first true plastic. Um, and celluloid was kind of a semi-plastic. This is the first true plastic. In the 1920s, uh, several German companies discovered how to color. The, they could paint it sometimes, but they discovered how to actually 
color of the plastic, the fake light itself. So then you started getting um, all these cool designs that you could now do with fake light. All right, so that's fake light. Um, and, and so everyone's trying to come up with another type of plastic. And then the 20s and 30s, we get lots and lots of these. So in the 1930s, cigarettes were huge. And the big one uh, was Lucky Strike. That's, that's, that was the number one cigarette. Camel cigarettes were number three. But then Camel started using something called cellophane, which was a new type of material. And they started packaging the cigarette packets in cellophane. And as you see from advertisements like this, it keeps them mild and fresh. You know, and again, you can see sealed fresh, you know, so this, and it worked. Camel became, you know, the number one for a while. And finally, Lucky Story had to give in and they started using cellophane, if you will, to actually surround their material. So cellophane goes back to the 19-teens and 1920s. It's technically a French invention. DuPont bought the rights for it in 1920. And really by the 1930s, it had become the symbol of freshness. You know, think about when you buy, say, hamburger meat. You know, you want to be able to see it, but you don't want to touch it and smell it in the store, but you want to be able to see that. But also this idea that, it, that you don't want it to be germy. So this is not cellophane. Um, but it, it has, as I just appear here, it has, I know you can barely see me, but it has a cellophane-like quality because it is something you can see through so you can see the product you are buying. Um, but yet you know that it's being kept clean from dirty hands that, that you know, everybody else has touched it before you touched it. Um, and cellophane was seen, you know, it, again, this is a post a germ theory world um, and cleanliness and sanitation is very key. So cellophane became kind of, you know, seen as modern society. Even the word itself became very popular. There literally were songs about cellophane. Uh, in 1933, one magazine described it as the most beautiful word in the English language, which actually I never thought about it, but after I read that uh, a while back, I remember thinking like cellophane, it does, it is a nice, you know, it does roll off the tongue quite well. Um, but this was again seen as almost uh, the future. And you know, models would wear cellophane. There were magazines devoted to cellophane. It, again, it, it's, there was literally a cellophane uh, craze for a while. And again, somebody took cellophane. A guy named Richard Drew, who worked for 3M, and learned how to put you know put something sticky on it, and that became what we call Scotch tape. Uh, but actually, in Scotland and in England, they refer to it as, as cello tape or cellophane tape. So people say, oh, I need more cellophane. And what they mean is what we say, oh, we need more scotch tape. So I think the most common example of cellophane today is actually scotch tape. Uh, something that's somewhat similar, but not exactly the same, uh, is saran wrap which even though not everything's saran wrap as far as the brand, but it, it is what, like Kleenex. It is one of those words we just kind of use whenever we need clean wrap, right? Um, saran wrap originally was not going to be used for food. It was initially invented by Dow Chemical Company uh, to cover theater seats, you know, um, so that it'd be easier to clean. Saran wrap was originally kind of greenish and it didn't smell good. Um, it, it did have, it, it had an off-gassing odor and it was a little thicker than what we might think of it as. During World War II, this actually played a big role because they often wrapped guns in essentially saran wrap to protect the guns from the elements. And this is an image of them doing that. Uh, after World War II, they were able to figure out a way to make it clear and to, to, to get the smell out. So in 1958, saran wrap premiered as a product for the kitchen to wrap your own food with. So basically it became kind of like cellophane, but, but actually even more clingy. By the way, I, I, you know, I was born in 1972, so I'm much older than you guys. And uh, when I was a kid, saran wrap actually was quite uh, handy. Today, whenever I do use it, i be honest with you, I, to me, it's useless. Every time I put it on, it doesn't stay, it doesn't stick. And I've thought many times, like, didn't this used to work better? And in fact, it did. 
actually, I, I think about 20 years ago, they changed the, uh, I want to say recipe, but they changed the chemical composition. I think it had to do with making it cheaper, but also making it more environmentally friendly. It actually doesn't clean as much as it used to. It really was very clingy and extremely helpful. I find it actually not very helpful and I can never actually rip it anymore. Um, they used to actually, in fact, you can't see it, but I have a scar right there. When I worked at a piece of joint, they used to have these big industrial saran wrap boxes that had a real knife on it and it fell off one day. It shouldn't have been up there and I tried to catch it. Uh, and it cut me to the bone actually. Um, and today they're very, they, they barely have a knife on them. That's another reason I don't think they work very because they're trying to make them safe. Anyway, way too much about saran wrap. And of course, everybody's into vinyl today. I have a lot of albums from when I was a kid. And I still have. Uh, vinyl itself, uh, records actually first premiered in 1930. There were earlier versions of these that were really glass, um, but vinyl records as we know were invented in 1930. There's lots of kinds of plastics. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to talk about one more, I think. But but just you know, the all different types of from nylons to uh, to lucite, to blue, you know, to plexiglass. I mean, you name you know the formica, vinyl fluorine, and, and astroturf, and on and on and on. But the one I do want to talk a little bit about polyethylene, which was first discovered in 1833 in Britain, and this is from to a large degree. I think when the first thing we probably think of when you think of plastic really is some version of this. And there's actually lots of different types of this. Um, but this is basically most of the toys you played with, um, you know, you know, pins, you know, all this kind of plastic here. This is what that is. So as one uh, of the inventors said, it's stiffer than steel, yet soft as candle wax. In other words, you can make it very hard, you can make it very soft, you can make it where it bends, you can make it very, you know, there's a lot of uses for this. And again, this is coming uh, out of petroleum, basically. So one of the things, I'll get my giant litter box here. So this is high density pothoethylene. And in fact, that's why it says HDPE on the bottom there. So that that's, that, you know, milk jugs, that sort of thing would be the HDPE. And then you have LDPE, low density uh, polyethylene. And so plastic bags would be made of that, trash bags would be made of that. Um, I think this one was actually HDPE, but things, I don't know, you can't see any, but, but, but things that are a little softer than this, um, that would be LDPE, right? And it's so many of the things that we see, again, the, 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 the stuff that your bread comes in, the honey, you know, uh, the lids for things, that's usually LDPE, low density. So it's a lot softer, but a lot more, I mean, again, that would be an example. So most of the plastic that we use today, at least in our daily lives, would be this stuff. Okay, so that's, a, that's a get, giving you some background on some of the plastics out there. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them. Okay, so kind of, to some degree, kind of back to trash for a moment. So we know that the Industrial Revolution of, in America, which really was the second Industrial Revolution, we started to get the arrival of factories. And as we talked about with sewage, um, uh, you know, the, uh, excuse me, in cholera, we talked a little bit about uh, the invention of pollution. So you start getting all this factory smoke and then people start talking about pollution and start talking about smog and people saying we need to clean the air. Then of course in the early 60s you get Rachel, I know we mentioned every lecture of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and of course that got people thinking about ecology and ecosystems and, and basically started the modern environmental movement. We've talked about the population bomb which was which, even though it's not as well known today but it had that same effect in the late 60s and 70s, thinking about how crowded we are, you know, how many people do we have, how much pollution are we creating? Um, what's the, was Rachel Carson, we're thinking about what are the effects on animals and the water? Um, and then, as we've talked about, like starting in 1973, there was our first energy crisis. And suddenly we're again thinking about the limits to things. And we're thinking about, you know, that nature isn't limitless and we need to take care of it. So again, all of these things are all beginning to come together by the 1970s. And that begins to affect how people think of trash. People, you know, even in the 19th century, people were thinking of trash from a sanitation viewpoint, from a germ viewpoint. 
But now we're starting to think of it in the matter of global concerns, environmental concerns, which is which are the different thing in many ways. And, and the very first day I showed you, and maybe I'll, I'll replay it, uh, at, you know, as a, with a link. But we talked about the crying Indian uh, commercial, as it's often known, with Iron uh, Iron Eyes Cody, um, who was actually Italian American, but. You know, this and it is a very powerful commercial and this idea that let's stop polluting. Native Americans don't pollute. They took care of the land. Why can't we be more like them? Um, and this was a, a famous commercial that played for 30 years um, that was done by, as you can see, the Keep America Beautiful Incorporated, uh, which was a product of the Ad Council. And of course, I mean, some garden clubs were, helped sponsor it. A couple of state governments helped sponsor it. But the main sponsors were, again, corporations like Coca-Cola. They, they actually offered a lot of money. And some of this may be legitimate concerns about pollution, but a lot of this was a bit of a PR campaign. It was, some people have called it greenwashing. So again, the message of, of the, uh, the commercial is, when you are done with something, throw it in a trash can. Later, they will say, you should recycle it. That wasn't quite as big in the early 70s yet. But throw it in the trash can. Don't just throw it on the ground. Good advice. I think we can all agree with that. We don't. And I will say, as a kid, litter was so much more common. I mean, it was really common to see people just throw their trash out the window, which fortunately you don't see that anymore. So we all know that's a terrible thing. So the message isn't bad. But again, why do they feel the need to do this? All these corporations. Well, if we're the ones polluting, and we, it, it, you know, and we're the problem. Therefore, we have to take care of it and we need to pick up our trash. And what that's actually doing is diverting the attention from people who are the main producers of pollution and trash. And that is corporations, large companies, governments. 98% you know, of trash is industrial trash, not the trash you and I do. Uh, by, by diverting your focus to you, which again, that's important. We, we need to be responsible. We're not looking at the big corporations. And that's, and that's kind of the lesson here. We're going to see that with plastic as well about 20 years later. So again, there is a lot of concern about trash. There's another image of fresh kills near New York. And, you know, we have these concerns. They, they, they get really big in the 70s with, with all the stuff I've mentioned. Uh, things kind of calm down a little bit in the 80s. People are still thinking about it, but you know, we, we, you know, this is the Reagan era. This is the era of, of big business. And, you know, some people are thinking, okay, that was a 60s thing to worry about the environment. Now we can, let, let's just expand. But it never went away. And by the late 80s, there was kind of a renewed environmental movement. Um, groups like Greenpeace get very popular and very well known. But I think the, the, the moment was, uh, Cap capitalized by this moment uh, when something called the Mobro 4000. Now, if you're not Gen X or older, you won't know, you probably won't know anything about this. But, uh, and again, I'll try to, there's a couple of videos about this. The New York Times did a really interesting one recently, and I'll, I'll play it for you uh, offline. But the Mobro 4000, which I just recently realized actually comes from my hometown in Jacksonville. Um, I, I never knew that, but it was a barge. And uh, a tugboat, uh, I, I think I had to write this. Yeah, I knew I was going to remember. Break of day was the name of the tugboat. And I wrote it down just so I wouldn't remember it. And so um, they had made a deal um, with New York City to haul their trash down to uh, North Carolina and to be converted into methane. But, you know, so in March of 1987, they get the trash. And they're heading back. And but there's a rumors, you know, um, that this was full, and it wasn't actually, but it was full of medical trash, gloves, gowns, diapers, needles, things like that. Uh, and that already is icky, I think, to a lot of us. But this is 1987. This is the you know the height of the AIDS epidemic, the height of AIDS fear. You can see now all these lectures are all kind of coming together. Um, and, they re and plus, it's, it's from New York City, right? I mean, they got that element to it. So North Carolina said, nope, we don't want it. Oh, no. So now <laughs> they're like, okay, what do we do with all this trash? 
And of course the media picked up on it. It was kind of the human interest story. It's just kind of a funny story, but then it started to actually become a thing. They went all the way down to Belize, Belize didn't want it. They went to Mexico, Mexico didn't want it. They went to Florida, Florida didn't want it. They, 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 were, they, they contacted England. I mean, they were just contacting everybody. Nobody wanted it. Uh, and of course, by this point, it was becoming very well known. Greenpeace actually put up a sign. They thought this is a great moment to, to get some attention. Next time, try recycling. Again, you can see right, I, I can't believe I never noticed it. Mobro 4000, Jacksonville, Florida, right there on the side of it. Um, and so eventually, by the way, the, the story ended in fall of 1987. New York City did finally agree to take it back. And, and I think it was Brooklyn, it was incinerated. The, the trash was eventually burned. So eventually they go away. In fact, I can remember in the 90s, people saying, you know, like, yeah, that barge is somewhere out in the ocean, still floating around. I mean, you know, again, we're talking about a six month uh, issue here, but people talk about this for years and years and years. Um, in 2018, there was a book by Megan McCarthy saying all that trash, which is about this story. And there's other children's books about this, there's documentaries about this. This has become the symbol of, our problem with trash. And if you've ever seen the movie Wally, I love Pixar films, and this is a great one. You know, the, the first few minutes of it basically shows, um, you know, the planet, people, you know, big corporations, the people buying stuff and throwing away stuff and buying stuff. And before you know, they just get so polluted and so just a planet of trash that all humans just eventually leave the planet. And the only people on Earth are these robots that are, their jobs are just to clean up trash. Um, I mean, this was, I mean, that was a, a film from about 10 years ago. But this had become kind of the story of trash. I mean, this is it. We're, we're running out of room for trash. Look, there's a barge floating in the ocean. People, again, people still mention this. Uh, when you look at maps of, you know, all the landfills and you start going, oh my gosh, look at all these landfills. Look how big they are. But of course, maps like this aren't to scale. Um, I mean, they would just be microscopic little dots if they were actually to scale. Um, the reality is, and again, you know, we are we we have to look at evidence as historians, and sometimes we can be quite skeptical. Um, not that we shouldn't recycle when that that trash isn't an issue, but the reality is, we can actually, if we really wanted to, you could we could build one landfill that could take care of all the trash that the U.S. creates for the next thousand years, and it really wouldn't be, theoretically speaking, it wouldn't be that big, forty-two square miles. Uh, about 135 feet tall. Um, it's about the size of, uh, of the Bronx or Brooklyn, if you've ever been to New York. Uh, Bronx, is, I, I said Brooklyn, it's Bronx on the screen, good Lord. Um, we're not really talking about big of a space. You know, th there is kind of a myth that we're running out. Now, not that we shouldn't be recycling, but there is kind of a myth about this that goes back to World War 4000 and some of these fears. But there are problems. And really it's litter that's a problem. Not just you and I, but but basically trash not in landfills and leakage from landfills, but really, although we've discovered leakage isn't as bad as we once thought it was, um, but it's really all the trash is just not making it to the landfills to begin with. Speaking of that, uh, we talked about Smokey Bear. Uh, most of you probably, I, I would guess, probably don't know Woodsy the Owl. This is a very 70s and 80s phenomenon. So Woodsy the Owl was uh, created by um, what was kind of, it was supposed to be a companion to Smokey Bear. Um, you know, the, the idea was Smokey Bear was being used not only for forest fires, but for pollution and blah, you know, all these things. So they thought, let's create Woodsy the Owl. He'll be the buddy of Smokey Bear. So this is U.S., uh, basically Department of Agriculture, Florida Forest, uh, excuse me, the U.S. Forestry Service um, created this. Uh, and they were very strict. They, you know, you couldn't, you know, people couldn't, you know, they, they control the image of Woodsy the Owl. For instance, when they ended Woodsy the Owl, they, uh, all the costumes had to be burned so nobody else could use these. Um, and so Woodsy the Owl was somebody that told people to not pollute uh, in the forest and parks and no, don't do vandalism and don't break. I mean, it wasn't a bad thing, of course. And I, again, I'll, uh, I'll have a couple of these commercials online for you guys. And there was some toys that, the, that they licensed uh, to get kids to think about you know, and of course the big line was give a hoot, don't pollute. Um, so you have that. And then in the late eighties, since our last lecture is gonna be about endangered species and exotics and endangered species, um, this comes up in the 1980s. 
the northern spotted owl, which was on the endangered species list. And as you'll learn, once that's the case, anything with federal dollars can't be used if it's going to harm one of those endangered species. And the spotted owl was up north uh, and out west, and a lot of major forests that were going to be cut down had spotted owls in them. And suddenly this becomes a huge debate between environmentalists and, and business interests. Um, and of course, the US Forestry Service was sponsoring the cutting down of trees, yet Woodsy the owl was their mascot. And so this, this became a huge PR disaster because people were like, they're killing Woodsy. They don't even care about their own Woodsy the owl. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Woodsy the owl eventually disappears. Plus it was just seen as he just wasn't as popular. Um, we'll come back to spotted owls another day. So late 80s, there, there is this growing, so back to plastics now. So there is this growing concern about trash and running out of trash, and maybe we need to I don't know, recycle. Greenpeace is telling us to recycle. So McDonald's, which didn't look like this in the 80s, but McDonald's, for instance, the, which at that time was the biggest fast food uh, restaurant, uh, and other restaurants did this as well. When you bought a burger from them, it would come in these styrofoam, which is another type of plastic, these styrofoam clam shells, if you will. In fact, just looking at this just takes me back. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. This is, this is what everything came in. And in fact, this is just McDonald's, but you can see, you know, whether it's quarter pounder, filet of fish, or scrambled eggs, or, you know, everything would have been this. By the way, I had the idea I thought, when I was putting together this class, I thought, I'm going to buy one of these on eBay and bring it to class. And I looked at the prices. I went, no, I'm not going to do that. I still want to have one of these, but I'm not willing to pay this much money for a clamshell. But that's why in today, and pretty much ever since you've been alive in this class, uh, you, when you guys get uh, McDonald's or anywhere, you're getting it in either paper or cardboard, something biodegradable, basically. So, you know, there was this huge, let me go back to this image. So there was a huge backlash to this, partly coming from the Mobro 4000 and just to climb it in the air. People started going, what a waste. These things you can't recycle. They're, they're, they're from petroleum. Uh, they don't degrade in the ground. Uh, if we keep doing this, we're gonna be a planet of trash. Let's get away from it. So McDonald's quit. They, they said, nope, we're gonna go to this stuff. And other fast food places did the same thing. There was a big backlash against plastic. And I, I mean, McDonald's was one of the biggest buyers of plastics. I mean, they literally sold millions and millions and millions of these every year. And there was a big plastic backlash. And plastic manufacturers realized we're in trouble unless we do something. So the Society of Plastics Industry, which is something that goes back to 1937, they got together and they said, okay, what are we going to do? And they kind of went back to the idea of the crying Indian, you know, and that worked, by the way. So they hired uh, Ronald Lysimer um, to come up with a PR plan. They gave him a five million dollar budget to do this. And one of the things that he did, first off, they created the Council for Solid Waste Solutions. You know, we're going to get environmental on you guys. And so this was the organization, and it's still around that was going to sponsor all these green initiatives. And again, the thing they started to focus on was recycling. We, this is what's great about plastic. You can reuse it, and you can recycle it. Wood just burns and it goes away and it just creates smoke. Um, this is reusable. This is something that again, we make it, and then when you're done with it, we can melt it and turn it into something else. And we can melt it, turn it into something else. It's a renewable resource. So plastic is our friend because it is recyclable. As he has said in several documentaries, because he now has reneged on a lot of the stuff. And in fact, a lot of the people involved in this have now become environmentalists. Um, they have admitted that this was a whole plan to just make people buy plastic. And it worked very, very well. Um, because in the 90s and early 2000s, the manufacturing of plastics exploded to the point that almost everything we touch now is plastic. So we all know what this symbol is. This is the recycling symbol. And it was in, you know, it designed in the early 70s, but it wasn't copyrighted. So it, anybody can use it or some version of it. So one of Lysimer's ideas 
Um, I think I got slightly out of order here. Let me move this up. It's amateur hour today, isn't it? Okay. Ah. Yep, amateur hour. Okay. So he said, well, we can use the same design and we can put them on the bottom of our plastics here. And of course, what they mean is all they're really saying is these are the types of designs that we can recycle. So we have different types of plastics that we can now recycle, or, or when well, I didn't just recycle, different types of plastics that these symbols symbolize. So whether they're PET, HDPE, PFC, that's really all these symbols mean. The triangle doesn't mean recyclable. It has to be a certain type to be recyclable. Most of the plastics that we're throwing in our recycle bin cannot actually be recycled. And if it can be recycled, a lot of this stuff isn't economically feasible to recycle. But and by the way, Lysimer went around to a lot of the state legislatures and had them pass a law through lobbyists he got them to use that said if they make plastic in their state, that they must have that little triangle. And of course, the, the law says it has to identify the type of plastic it is so that people can make their own decisions, which is fine. But, but they purposely used that chasing arrows design because most of us go, should I buy this? Well, I can recycle it. I can buy it. Half the time we don't, in fact, only about 10% of all things have actually been recycled, of plastics have actually been recycled. We don't, most of us don't actually recycle. Uh, and again, uh, we think we can recycle all the stuff, which really is kind of wish cycling, as one person calls it. Um, so this was really, again, this was a PR sort of, um, I knew it, I knew I didn't have that one image, darn it. <laughs> Uh, this is really a bit of a, a PR uh, ploy here. So uh, at most recycling plants, most of the time they just spend pulling out stuff that they can't recycle, which is most of the stuff in the recycle bins. Um, again, these types of things, just for your knowledge, they can be recycled. Um, again, for metal cans can be recycled, things like that. K-cups, a billion are made every year, and I'm embarrassed that I have some of these, but I do. These can't be, they, they still can't be recycled at all. These things can't be recycled. Clamshells can't be recycled. Um, not recycled. It could be, but it's not. It's not worth the money to the company for the, the amount of effort it takes to pull the pins out, do everything you gotta do to recycle it. Most plastics, even the stuff that goes in recycle bins, most of that plastic actually goes in the landfill. And they knew that when they're pushing all this recycle stuff, you know, you got, you know, down in Florida, I think this is uh, Sarasota, Florida, you got skip the bin, in other words, skip, you know, don't go to the trash bin, go to the recycle, you know, to, to recycle. This is the scary, <laughs> totes my goats from Niagara Falls. It's like a pagan god here. <laughs> recycle, it's great. Um, in Georgia, you have recycle bin. Uh, I forgot this guy's uh, the guy on the skater guy on the right, but you know, again, many of these are promoted by local cities. A lot of these are promoted by plastic companies. And again, recycle is a good thing, but most of us don't know the reality of recycling. It's, we still should do it. I, I believe in that. But, and I know I'm getting out of history here, but the reality is most of us are not going to be recycled. And again, most of this is really a PR campaign from the 90s. And again, it worked. Um, plastic took off again. Lately, there has been another backlash against plastic. People were, were becoming a lot more aware of the realities of this. Um, so we are starting to see people go the other way. Now, one of the things that has happened in the last 20 years or so is there, you know, for instance, there was a big movement against straws. And straws are actually something you use once and you throw away. And it does seem ridiculous, right? I mean, I never liked straws anyway. You know, so you know, these little plastic straws, right? And you hear things like, you know, 5 billion of these every year and stuff. Most of those numbers are not accurate. Um, we do use a lot of straws. It's nowhere near as much as you can. And so there was a big anti-straw movement, people getting metal straws. But the reality is this is literally a drop in the bucket. 
Now there are environmental concerns with straws and there's a very famous video that I'll, I'll be linking down below of where a straw was in the nose of a sea turtle. In fact, and it, I, I can't watch it and they pulled this huge straw out. So there are problems with these, especially in the oceans. But again, it kind of became the symbol of kind of like Mobro 4000, this is killing the earth. Not quite. And in fact, uh, as the plastic industry will tell you, and I know we can't always trust the big industry, but you know, it actually is less carbon problematic to create a lot of plastics than it is to create metals, to create paper, to create glass. Because to create these things, you have to burn a lot of fossil fuels just to create these things as opposed to creating a lot of the plastics that we use. So if you look at a, a, what's called a life cycle analysis, the LCA, uh, when you do these for products, you basically are saying, you know, what is the cost to make them, including environmental costs, to use them, to get rid of them, to recycle them. Uh, when you do this, it's actually quite surprising that a lot of plastics actually come off better than a lot of stuff that we consider to be better. Um, and again, it, it is quite interesting we start talking about the energy it takes to create a can versus a plastic container. Again, the problem is the back end is the problem. What happens to the plastic when we're done using it? That's where the real problems come in. And the fact that it often does not wind up in a landfill, but instead winds up in places like the ocean or a river where it can go into the nose of a sea turtle. Uh, but again, well, from a pure creation of a carbon footprint of these actually, um, plastics are pretty far up there. It's aluminum glass are actually pretty far down on the creation side of it. One more thing about recycling, both for aluminum cans and for milk jugs, it can only be recycled one time. One time is all you get out of it. And once, they're, once you get something made out of recyclable, like reused material, it actually can't be recycled again. So we, you know, we can't keep recycling it like they have kind of told us. You got, you got, you use it, then re maybe recycle it. One more use, that's it, um, which is problematic. Again, the last twenty years, there's been a pretty big discovery of how much plastics have are winding up in the ocean. This is just some of the things that have been pulled out of the oceans. Um, and what you have in the ocean are these, what's known as gyres, these, these underwater currents. And what happens is a lot of trash gets trapped in these gyres. Uh, the famous one is out in the Pacific, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, as it's known. And this, is, again, has become kind of like Mobro 4000. It's a real thing. It's a real problem. But at the same time, it has also been exaggerated, too, like how big it is. How, you know, it's a problem. But just like with overpopulation, I mean, this is kind of a running theme. You know, there, there's always emotions involved in this, not always a lot of evidence. So it is a problem, but how big of a problem we're still debating. I think one of the most disturbing things, though, is these things called nurdles, which is the, kind of the base element of a lot of plastics, right? You, these nurdles are what are melted down into the moldable plastic we know, and then they can be broken down into more microscopic nurdles, if you will. And over time, that's exactly what happens. You go to the beach and you can find literally millions of nurdles on almost every single beach. Uh, a huge amount of animals that are pulled out of the ocean actually have microscopic nurdles in them. Uh, it is quite amazing. In fact, you and me, we have plastic in our bodies. I don't mean just like caps in our teeth, but we have nurdles in our body. Um, so, you know, we got plenty of means for that. So what does that mean in the future? Well, first off, I'm a historian. That's not what I need to be predicting, but that's the unanswered question. Um, is this going to be a problem in the future? We don't know, and, 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 but, but it's something we better be thinking about. But that's for a political science class. That's not for a history class. So the whole idea of reduce, reuse, and recycle, it, it's not happening at all. The, about the only thing that is happening is a little bit of recycling. And as I said earlier, oh, there's the image I was looking for. As I said earlier, uh, recycling employees are usually pulling most of it out because it can't be recycled or it's too expensive to recycle. So again, only a small proportion of plastic products are actually recycled. Okay, so uh, at the end, I kind of dipped in a little bit almost into policy there, uh, but there you go. So turn off your plastic, you know, hit your plastic uh, uh, <laughs> keyboard, click on your plastic mouth and turn this 
program off. Okay, thank you guys. And I'll see you in.